It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be in his presence. It's good to be able to turn to his word. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open to Acts chapter 8. We're going to begin reading there in verse 26 in in just a few moments. Uh, But before we read there, let me remind you where we're at in the story, because this is a story we're going through, right? Uh, we're, We're studying and we're looking at the early church Uh, If you remember, in the beginning of Acts chapter 8, the gospel begins to spread outside of Jerusalem. The Great Commission, the the command that Jesus gave to his disciples was to make disciples in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, he said, to the ends of the earth. But we know up until this point, the message only went primarily into Jerusalem, and it's done a good job spreading it in Jerusalem. The teachings of the apostles have filled Jerusalem and now it's because of persecution that the, the message goes outside, right? It was the persecution of the Christians there in Jerusalem led by Saul that drove everyone but the apostles outside of the city. Now, these persecuted Christians were scattered. They were scattered with a purpose, as Pastor Floyd shared last week, right? They were strategically, I believe, this was a plan of the Lord to spread out Uh, the believers into the Judean villages, and kind of like dandelion seeds, they were sown, and the gospel was sown, amen? And then Philip goes into Samaria, and, and multitudes of Samaritans accept Jesus Christ. Understand, it is not the apostles who bring the gospel to Samaria. It's primarily the work of one young leader, one young man named Philip. He was one of those that was appointed to oversee the distribution of the funds in Jerusalem, but my guess is that ministry probably shut down for a little while with all that's happening in Jerusalem. But God's doing this remarkable work through Philip who was simply willing to serve the Lord. We see he's proclaiming Christ in Samaria in verse 5 of chapter 8. Verse 6 tells us that multitudes hear the message. Verse 7 tells us that the power of God is evident in his ministry. There are demons that are cast out. There are many who are paralyzed and and lame who are healed. Verse 8 says there is much joy in the city of Samaria. Can I just say this is like a full-blown spiritual awakening, right, that's happening among the Samaritans. Many are baptized, and the apostles hear about it, and they approve of the work, and so they send Peter and John down to them, and Peter and John lay their hands on them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. This is another instance in uh, the book of Acts where this is outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Today is the day that we celebrate, really, the birth of the church, amen? As the Holy Spirit was poured out on those 120 in an upper room, God did something so amazing in and through their lives, and it's because of that that we sit here today. And so here's another outpouring of the Spirit of God in the book of Acts. I just want to say this today. There are seasons in our lives, seasons of progress, when it seems like everything is going good, right? And for Philip, I think this is one of those seasons. The, the gospel is exploding in Samaria, and he's right in the middle of a move of God. And you might wonder, why would God mess with something that's going so well? But the apostles send Peter and John there to Samaria, and this frees up Philip for the next mission that the Spirit had for him. Today we're going to find out what that mission is. Look at verse 26. Verse 26 of Acts chapter 8. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. And so Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. 
And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself in Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. May God bless the reading of his word today. As you look at that passage, again, I think verse 26 can seem a little strange to those of us who think about success in terms of numbers, right? We're brought up to think that the size of the audience determines the importance of the speaker, but right in the middle of what we would call ministry success, God directs Philip. He says, Philip, I want you to get out of town. I want you to leave. Leave right now. Verse 26, the angel of the Lord says, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Understand, there is big evangelism happening in Samaria, and in the middle of that, God sends Philip to the desert to minister to just one man. And I think it's a reminder to us that we should never diminish the value of just one, right? Like, big evangelism is great, Billy Graham, these huge crusades, but one-on-one, I want to tell you, is also great. One-on-one, because when we reach one, we never know who that one is going to reach, right? Or what God's going to do through that one life. We can also see this just because that we're seeing success in our lives. It does not mean that God will not move us sometimes. If I was in Philip's position and I heard a message like this from God, I would be like, well, that can't be God, right? Get behind me, Satan, right? Right? God's using me here in Samaria. He's not going to take me somewhere else. He's not going to send me out. So often when God speaks, we have our excuses, don't we, as to why we shouldn't respond. Three popular excuses not to respond to God. If you're following along in your note sheet, write these down. I think maybe, just maybe you can relate. Number one is not me. Not me. God, can't you see I'm busy? <laughs> God, I'm already doing so much for your kingdom. Call somebody else, right? Not me, right? The second popular excuse is not now. God, this is not a good time. Just got to let you know. Let me finish what I'm doing here, and then maybe, maybe I'll do what you want me to do. Number three is not there. Philip could have said, God, that's a desert place. We're in a big city. You're going to send me out there? I'm not leaving ministry in Samaria to go to a desert. How many of you can relate to some of those excuses sometimes? Not me, not now, God, not there. You see, it's foolish from man's perspective, but it is wise from God's perspective because the Holy Spirit is guiding Philip. The Holy Spirit works among the many, but he also works on the one. And as God calls Philip, the Holy Spirit is also working in the heart of an Ethiopian man who is traveling back home from Jerusalem. I want to ask today, do you have that sense in your own life? Do you have that sense that the Holy Spirit is guiding you, that he's actually leading you? I want to say there is beauty in a life that is submitted to God. Some of you hear that, submitted to God, and it, 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 kind, of, it kind of scares you, right? Maybe you say, well, well, if I really surrender to God, he's going to take me to a desert place, right? He's going to take me to some remote village where there's no electricity, there's no running water, right? Listen to me. If you fear being surrendered because you think God's going to make you do something that you don't want to do, you don't yet know the heart of God. You don't yet know the heart of God. I want to say it is exciting to live a life surrendered to God because God will take you places, amen? He'll take you places that you could never imagine. And hear me, there is no better place to be. There's no safer place to be, I, I don't think, than right in the middle of the will of God. My son is wrapping up his time on the mission field in Nepal this week, and some people have asked me while he's been over there, aren't you nervous? I mean, he's on the other side of the world. He's in some remote places, but, but I fully believe this, that my son is safer in the mountains of Nepal following Jesus' leading than, than he would be here. I believe he's safer following Jesus as leading over there than he would be in some university here in the States if he wasn't serving the Lord and following the Lord and living a life surrendered to God, amen? 
And, and so when we surrender to God, it's, it's amazing because to be in the center of his will is the safest place to be. There's a number of surprises there, though, as we look at verse 6. First of all, you see these words, the angel of the Lord, right? The angel of the Lord is an Old Testament phrase that's uh, used to describe God getting directly involved with a specific person. Now, why would the ancient Hebrews have used such a phrase? I believe it was to tell us that God is God's own messenger, right? That's what an angel's supposed to be. God isn't, isn't somewhere so far off. No, he is involved in our lives. And, and so God comes to his people as his own messenger. This passage isn't any, any exception to that formula because we see in verse 29 and then we see in verse 39, God is directly involved as the Holy Spirit, right? And when the angel shows up and an angel shows up before you and gives you instruction, okay, there is no question that God is speaking. God makes his desire known very clearly to Philip. But the other thing that's surprising is the timetable for Philip's journey. God commands him to get up and depart about noon, okay? We know where he's sending him. He's sending him into the desert, right? How many of you would choose to walk out into the desert at midday, right? No, no, you, you don't go to the desert in the middle of the day. If you're going to go to the desert, you go there the same time you would travel to the sun at night, right? You got to beat the heat. Some of you missed that, all right? You got to beat the heat. But God didn't allow Philip to beat the heat because God had a plan. There was a certain timetable that God knew about that Philip didn't know about. Otherwise, Philip would have said, let's wait till the sun goes down. Let's wait till it gets a little cooler out there. And so Philip leaves Jerusalem and he goes down to Gaza. I love verse 27. It just says, and he rose and he went. I love the simplicity of that statement. Because there seems to be no wrestling with the call, right? There, there seems to be, at least from our understanding, there's no hesitation here. Philip responds in obedience to the voice of God. You know, sometimes I think we just complicate the Christian life so much. What if we just did what God tells us to do, right? What if we just obeyed when, when God spoke? So many people, I'll tell you this, they, they come to me and they're like, Pastor, I want to know, like, some, give me some deep stuff. Like, I want to know the complex realities of God. They, they want another study on the end times. They want to know, how do I move in the prophetic? All of this stuff, and that's great. But at the same time, they're not obedient to the simple commands of God. Hear me today. If you want to know God in greater ways, be obedient to what he's already told you to do. And as you respond in obedience, as you live a life of faith, guess what? You're go he's going to grow your faith. You're going to have a greater understanding of who he is. And so Philip heads toward Gaza. He heads towards this old Philistine territory. Today, it's Palestinian territory. It's largely desert. In fact, the angel says this is a desert place. Now again, for Philip to leave all of the action in the big city of Samaria and go down to Gaza would be similar to a, a pastor of a megachurch saying, I'm going to go to this rural city and pastor this little tiny church. It doesn't seem to make sense, at least humanly speaking. In fact, the phrase about this area being a desert place seems to highlight the fact that God was sending Philip out to a place where you really wouldn't expect to, there to be many people at all, right? The wilderness is a barren place. It's a dangerous place. The, the Word of God often uh, represents it as a place where demons and evil spirits reside, right? It was when Jesus went into the desert that he was tempted by Satan. It doesn't seem, at least in the natural, like God's given Philip a, a very productive field to work in, and yet God knows what's best. Thankfully, God is on the throne of heaven, and he moves the heart of Philip, and at the same time, Philip is surrendered enough to obey God and, and to, to trust that, man, if I leave the Samaritans, God's going to take care of them, right? He's begun to work. I'm going to trust him with that. And so verse 27 says, he rose and went. And as he goes, there's, there's a man. It says he's an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. So here's Philip, and he's on a lonely desert road, but he's not alone. There's somebody else on that road, 
Someone you, you wouldn't expect anyone out there, but there's someone else out there, and it's a very important someone. There's another surprise in verse 27. The, the very important someone is not from around these parts, right? That's what they say down south, right? Not from around here, right? He, he's, a, he's a foreigner, okay? That's what you need to understand. Number one about this man, he is a foreigner. And, and he's come to Jerusalem in order to worship as a Jewish proselyte, okay? He, he's someone who wasn't born into Judaism, but he's adopted the Jewish faith. But even more surprising is the fact that he is a eunuch, okay? He is an emasculated male who, because of his, you could say, surgery, can have no lineage of his own. He's got no future except the future of the ruler that he serves, you see, they believed in that time that by stealing one's hope for family and posterity, it's supposed to ensure that the eunuch would remain loyal to his ruler. There is something to be said, I think, about the attack on the family structure today. Because I, I believe there are those that would prefer you not to have a strong family surrounding you. There are those who would prefer you have no lineage of your own and no future except that which they can provide. When you talk about the issue of abortion today, I know, man, that, that's the hot topic right now, right? But maybe you've read, there are companies that are providing transportation. If you live in a state where abortion is not available, they're providing transportation for their employees to go out of state to get what they would call health care. It's, it's abortion, Okay. Tesla will cover travel and lodging costs for employees to receive health care services not offered in the states they reside. Now, why are they doing this? Is it because they care so much about the individual? We just want them to have a choice on the matter. No, I, I think this. It's in their best interest, the company's best interest. You have no family. It's in the company's best interest. You have no children to look after and worry about because then you can focus all your energy on the job, right? You can focus all your energy in the company. But when you're at the end of your life, hear me, when you're lying on your deathbed, I guarantee you HR will not be there, right? <laughs> HR is not going to be present there, right? On those final days, it's family that would surround you. But even back then, it was understood if this individual has no family and no lineage to speak of, he'll be only be loyal to his ruler. We see the designation of this important official and, and dedicated Jewish convert by the term eunuch. It's in verse 27, verse 34, 36, 38, 39. I believe the repetition of the word throughout the passage is intended to show us that something special is going on here. But some of you are wondering what I'm talking about. Why does it matter so much that he's a eunuch? Well, Deuteronomy 23, verse 1. I'm going to read it from the King James, uh, so the archaic language kind of softens the message, but hopefully you'll understand. It says this, He that is wounded in the stones or has his privy member cut off shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Now, if you don't understand what I'm saying there, read it in the ESV, okay? All of a sudden there's this aha moment, all right? Wow. And it's harsh. It's harsh because this man is traveling all the way to Jerusalem to worship God, but it's very likely that he would not have been allowed even into the court of the Gentiles because he was castrated. We don't know for sure if, if the temple officials maybe didn't realize it, but he, he may have come to the gate of the temple all the way from Ethiopia and been turned away. I don't know, maybe he had enough money to bribe somebody, but whether the eunuch got into the temple court or how he got there or didn't get there isn't the focus of the story. What we have here is a man who would have technically been excluded from the presence of the Lord. He would have been excluded from the presence of the Lord, but he has been and is continuing to go out of his way to seek God's presence. Listen to me, there may be things in your life there may be things in your past that you feel like would exclude you from the presence of the Lord. But I want to tell you this. If you can push past those things and you can continue to seek him, I know he will meet with you. He will meet with you. James says clearly, James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's a promise we have, right? And so here's this eunuch. He would have technically been excluded, but he's going to Jerusalem. He's, he's doing whatever he can to get into the presence of God, and here he is going home, and he's reading from this scroll. It wasn't a cheap scroll. You couldn't just pick up a scroll anywhere. It was very expensive to get a scroll of Isaiah, and he's reading through the scroll of Isaiah as he's heading home. Verse 29, the Spirit said to Philip, 
go over and join this chariot. And so Philip, what does it say? He ran, underline that verse, underline that word. He ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Understand, Philip wasted no time in following the direction of the Holy Spirit. He ran. He could have said to himself, man, I don't even know if I speak this guy's language. (laughs) Of course, that wouldn't have been a very good excuse for someone who had been at Pentecost and seen firsthand, right? Language really doesn't matter. He could have argued, hey, we're not from the same social class. We we just don't have anything in common. He's not going to pay attention to someone like me. It sounds like all of our excuses, right, when the Holy Spirit tells us to go talk to someone, right? Yet, unlike many of us, Philip didn't engage in the what-if scenarios and said, He stuck his neck out, and he took a risk for the glory of God. I think we need to take this lesson to heart. What if we would take more risks for the glory of God? Maybe we would see a miracle like Philip sees here. Because understand, God's timing is perfect, and and God's preparation for our faithful evangelism is ideal. But if we procrastinate, we put people and we put our effectiveness at risk. When God speaks, fill this in, don't procrastinate. When God speaks, don't procrastinate. Slow obedience is disobedience. You guys know that one. My, my old youth pastor, Mike Esposito, used to say it all the time. Slow obedience is disobedience. And so when God says to share with someone, we need to go and do it rather than worry about it. We should not be intimidated to share Jesus with anyone, not even the wealthy and not even the famous. No one is so well off that they don't need Jesus. It's amazing because we live in a world that says, don't speak about Jesus. You can talk about anything, don't speak about Jesus, right? Like, just keep that message to yourself, and yet the world does not hesitate to impose its message on us, right? Just turn on the TV for a few minutes, and you'll hear all about what the world says is important. They'll they'll shove that stuff right down your throat. And I say, when the world stops cramming its message down my throat, I'll stop talking about Jesus. (laughs) Uh, Of course, I know they'll never stop, right? And so I'm never going to stop. And and I think the great tragedy of the church in America today is not that we are censored, but that we are self-censored, right? We've shut our own mouth, our own mouths. We've silenced ourselves. And hear me, no one can really shut your mouth except you, right? Those of you parents, you know that. Nobody can shut your kid's mouth except them, right? You can try all you want. Speak up again. But I wonder, why can't we be more bold to declare the gospel, to say to someone, you know what, Jesus loves you. Jesus died to bring you into a right relationship with him. And so Philip sees this opportunity, and what does it say? He ran to this man. And I I love the fact that Philip starts out with a question. Isn't that how Jesus started many of the discussions with those who needed him? He would bring up a question. He asked the name of the Gadarean demoniac. To the one who touched his clothes, this woman that had been hemorrhaging, he said, who touched me, right? He asked a man by the pool of Bethesda, he said, do you want to be well, right? He he started with something obvious. He uh, allowed the individual to respond, and then he proceeded to share his truth. From my own experience, I, I don't think it's so effective for us to just grab a megaphone and stand out on the street corner and say, you need Jesus, you're a sinner. Now, hear me, God can use that. I know of stories of God using that, right? but I think it's much more effective to start where the individual is already interested, right, and move from there to what the individual really needs. It it might start with a discussion of world events where you're just talking with somebody at work and you say, man, can you believe what's going on, right? What happened in Texas? How do you you deal with that, right? And and begin a discussion, and, and, and we can start there, but it is our task to take them from there and bring them to Jesus, in this case, the eunuch is reading a passage that we, we know is a, a messianic passage, right? He's reading it out loud, as they often did in that day. And all of this sets Philip up for an opportunity. This guy was not reading from one of the 50 chapters in Isaiah that don't directly refer to Jesus. He was reading from the one passage that most clearly speaks of Jesus' sacrificial death for our sins at the exact same time that Philip is running up to the chariot. Do you see why it's important we don't procrastinate, right? 
that we would be where God wants us to be at the time he wants us to be there, right? That's what we call providence, right? That God would bring all of this together. What an opportunity. Because we know that the fulfillment of this passage is in Jesus, just as the eunuch is about to discover. It goes like this. Look at verse 32. It says, now the passage of Scripture that he was reading was this. Like a lamb, he was led to the slaughter. Uh, like, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The passage that he's reading is known to us as Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. And it's recorded in this passage as it was translated into the Greek version we know as the Septuagint. Now, this was a, a problematic passage in Hebrew interpretation because it didn't fit the standard theology of the time. Some rabbis would look at this passage of the suffering servant, and they took it to be kind of, I guess you could say, an autobiographical protest from Isaiah. They said Isaiah is speaking about himself here as the suffering servant. Others said that the suffering servant was Israel. That's what they, they said. Well, it's got to be Israel because the nation has suffered in, in so many ways. But either way, it doesn't sound very good. Some thought prior to, to Christ that this referred to the Messiah, but they found it hard to accept that the Messiah would suffer like this because the passage tells us that God's servant is a victim. And no one wants to be a victim. And yet this victim was a victim with dignity. He was a victim who faces adversity like a hero. Now, the author's choice of this Septuagint, again, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, for the passage gave him a chance to, to really drive home the message to a Greek-speaking audience. The noun translated as humiliation was a, a, a very ugly noun to Greek peoples because humility wasn't a virtue in that time. And humiliation was considered, man, that's a, that's a dead end with regards to your reputation. You've been humiliated, you're, you're done with, right? Humiliation usually meant the end of the story. But it gets even worse because the noun translated judgment or justice or trial, it, it's pronounced this way in the Greek is krisis. Krisis, it's where we get our noun crisis, right? And although the noun clearly means trial here, as in the servant didn't get a fair trial, the word also has this idea of, of a tipping point. This is a, a crucial juncture where the individual gets a chance to overcome the obstacles and, and change for the better or triumph for the good or fail, of course. But here it says that the servant of God didn't even get a chance to turn the difficulty of life into something more the opportunity was stolen from him. In short, he did not get a fair trial. And then there is this phrase, who can describe his generation? Or who can even speak about or talk about his descendants? Isn't this an interesting text for the Holy Spirit to put in front of a man who has no prospects for any lineage? Isn't this a great challenge to a man who's obviously searching for meaning in his life. Somewhere, sometime, there was someone who faced the prospect of no future. Who is this man? But the Isaiah passage that is quoted doesn't stop with no future. It has a promise of a tremendous inheritance in verse 12 of Isaiah 53. Because the sacrifice that the servant made, because of that, it is possible for many to be justified and forgiven. He bears the iniquities or the sins of others. Man, there is no way you can read Isaiah 53 honestly and not see Jesus. He's all over it. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? That's a good question. Touch your neighbor and say, that's a good question. That's a good question, right? And then Philip, what does it say? I love this. It just says he opened his mouth. I don't know if he knew everything he was going to say. He had all the, you know, all the notes lined out. I, I got this argument all together. He just opens his mouth. And beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news. Literally, he evangelized him about Jesus. Understand, Philip wasn't drawn into some rabbinic discussion about the scripture. He's not, here's my personal speculation. No, he saw this as an opportunity to share about Jesus' sacrificial death. And I'm sure he would tell of Jesus' humiliation. 
and the unjust trial that he had experienced. And I'm sure he went on to share how this eunuch could become a part of the lineage of Jesus by receiving him as Savior and Lord. Listen, as we grow in our understanding of Scripture, the more time you spend in the Word of God, the more you will see this, that all of the Bible points to Jesus in one way or another. All of the Bible points to Jesus in one way or another. But, but Philip starts here in Isaiah, where the eunuch was reading, and he preached Jesus to him. This passage in Isaiah that's shared here in Acts is just a small portion of one of several of Isaiah's suffering servant songs that predicted the suffering of the Messiah. Others predicted that the Messiah would be a light to the nations of the world from which this Ethiopian had come. And this particular song, it starts in, in chapter 52, verse 13, with the crucifixion, with the, the covenant blood of Jesus being sprinkled on many nations. And it goes on to speak of him being rejected and not esteemed by man, considered to be smitten by God. It predicts him being slaughtered without his resistance and being buried in a rich man's tomb. But more importantly for this Ethiopian and for us today are the verses that follow, that he bore our sins that his death was our guilt offering, that the punishment that brings us peace today, it was upon him. And not only that, that he would rise to justify many. The righteous one will cause many to be accounted righteous. Now, when you share the gospel, here's what I would challenge you to do. Focus on who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. That's the heart of the gospel, right? Focus on who Jesus is and what Jesus has done because that's the essence of the gospel. Don't focus first on what people have to do for God. That's where we get it wrong. If you just do this, and the, let me tell you who Jesus is and let me tell you what he has done, right? And, and as people respond to the gospel, the Holy Spirit can do a work to change them, amen? Focus on who Jesus is and what he's done. Preach Jesus because Jesus will preach anywhere. And don't ever say, man, these people are different. They, they need a different message. No, the message the world needs is Jesus. He is the hope of the world. Share who he is and, and, and share what he's done. When, when you don't feel like you have the words, just open your mouth and trust the Holy Spirit to speak through you, right? The next verse, it says that as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, look, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, let's not rush through this moment too quickly because this is a significant moment. Because here is a man who had involuntarily had his loyalty to Queen Candace guaranteed by his own mutilation. Here is a man who voluntarily converted to Judaism because he's looking for some kind of assurance. He's looking for some kind of blessing in his life. And now he's willing to undergo a symbolic ceremony to pledge his loyalty to a new master, the master, right? Jesus Christ. And I think the question that he asks, I think it's almost a dare to fill up, right? What prevents me from being baptized? The question shows he, he was very much aware of the hindrances he faced in Judaism. Maybe he was even rejected for Jewish baptism because of his status as a eunuch, but regardless of whether he was just excited about the opportunity be, to be baptized or he's challenging Philip because he thought, man, the, the prospect is just too good to be true for somebody like me, for my life. But he asked the question, and I love the question. I would ask it of some of you today. What prevents you from being baptized? <laughs> Seriously. Is Jesus your Lord and is your Savior? Then what prevents you from getting baptized? Listen, if you want all of him and all that God has for you, that only comes through a life of obedience and surrender. We were baptized in obedience to the command of Jesus, right? Because he, he called us to do that. Now, if you're reading from the ESV like I am, you may notice that there's a verse missing. Did you notice that? It goes right from verse 36 to 38. Anybody see that? Or you guys didn't catch that, right? You're like, where's verse 37? Like, what's the deal with that? It's like the hotels that have no 13th floor button, right? But we all know the 14th floor is really the 13th floor. You can't fool us, okay? Um, but why is this verse missing, right? Or if you look down in the footnotes, if you're reading the ESV, uh, you can see it's because our oldest Greek manuscripts don't have verse 37 in them. 
And so it's likely that it wasn't there. I'll just be honest. It wasn't there when Acts was first penned. However, if you believe like I believe that the Holy Spirit was even involved in the copying of the manuscripts, you'll see this is a verse that clarifies, probably at a later date, probably uh, not Philip's words necessarily, but the relationship between belief and baptism. Verse 37. It's hard to read if you're reading it down there in the footnotes, okay? (laughs) But it makes it clear that belief comes first. It says, and Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And so he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Whether you understand that verse as being true or not, it's obvious that the eunuch made a positive decision for Jesus, and believer's baptism is what followed, right? Even without verse 37, the process is implied because without the verse, Philip doesn't actually answer him. And in the next verse, the eunuch takes the initiative. Verse 38, and he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. There are many paintings of the eunuch's baptism, if you, if you Google search it, some very famous ones, right? I just have a, a problem with each of them. So often you just see Philip sprinkling water on him, right? It's just a little, I'm going to pour this over your head. Now, let me read that verse again. They both went down into the water, right? Into the water. I'm not sure the artist understood what that word baptism means. In the Greek, if I want to plunge something like a, like a water pot or some dirty clothes into the water, I use the, the the term it's pronounced baptizo, baptizo, right? Baptism, right? It it means to plunge something all the way under the water. And and for us, we understand that this is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It, It symbolizes also this, God raising us up to new life. And so Philip affirmed in in this action, right, that the eunuch could be baptized. And get this, what was not possible for the eunuch, that he'd be circumcised if he wanted to join the people of God, was now made possible by circumcision's replacement, which is baptism. Baptism is the sign of the new covenant, right? And so get this, this man could not fully and equally participate, right, as a, as a proselyte of Judaism in the promise of Abraham, but now he steps into that promise. One who was made a eunuch by men would go back to Ethiopia, and he would found a church there. The man who could have no children would become the father of the Ethiopic church, right? And then in the next verse, something really strange happens. Verse 39, and when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing, right? We can just kind of read that and just be like, we miss it, right? This is one of those times when God just does something like, I don't know how he did it, he just did it, right? It, It says that after Philip left him, though, The eunuch went away rejoicing. Can I just say, joy is always the result in the book of Acts when people come to faith in Jesus Christ. But but I can't help but wonder if the eunuch got back in his chariot and, and as he gets back in there and he tries to understand where Philip went, I don't even know where that guy, he's just gone, right? He didn't even say goodbye, right? But I'm sure that he continued to read from where he had just left off in the scroll of Isaiah. Because if he read on from that place where he had just been reading in 53rd chapter, he would have soon come to these words in Isaiah 54, 1, sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. And then just a bit further down in the text, this is unreal, Isaiah 56, beginning in verse 3. These words must have jumped off the page to this man as he read them. It said this, says this, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name Better than sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Isn't it amazing that Isaiah's prophecy in our chapter 56 came true as the eunuch was trying to understand Isaiah 53, (laughs) right? Isn't it wonderful that the eunuch who, in, in human terms, had no future is now going to have a future that's better than sons and daughters? 
He, he can't have sons and daughters, but he has a better future. He's got spiritual sons and daughters. And, and, and you can look at this passage, man, and you can just see the Holy Spirit all over it, right? The Holy Spirit's at work in so many different levels, and he uses Philip mightily because he was simply willing to obey the Spirit's leading. And the Isaiah 56 passage becomes absolutely fulfilled when the eunuch responds to Jesus because of Isaiah 53. Understand, any barriers that this eunuch might have faced in Jerusalem, any barriers he might have faced in Judaism have been torn down through this suffering servant that we know today is Jesus Christ. And it's the same for each of us this morning. Any barriers that we might have faced to know God and, and to be known by him have been torn down for us by the suffering servant, Jesus Christ. And so now we have access, amen? What I love about the eunuch, though, is, man, he was seeking God. He, he was going after God. And so when it comes to salvation and baptism, the initiative is really from the eunuch. It's not even from Philip. Like, I, I see nothing in here that says, Philip, beg this guy, right? Come on, you got to respond. It's almost like he responds without an invitation because he has already been seeking God. Let me tell you this today. Don't wait for someone to beg you to do what's right for your own soul. Like, if you've heard the gospel, Scripture says today is the day of salvation. Don't wait for somebody to beg you to say a prayer. Respond to what the Holy Spirit's doing in your own heart. Right now, you can make a decision. I'm going to run to Jesus. I'm going to run to my Savior on my own account. It's as simple as saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And it's as challenging as surrendering the rest of your life to him. But belief in Jesus, can I just say, it's not just a matter of the head. It's a matter of the heart. The message that you've heard and you've received, it's got to travel. Sometimes it's the longest distance, right, from our head to our heart. That that which we know now becomes real to us. Verse 40, but Philip found himself in Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Now, now that his job is complete, Philip, again, is snatched away by the Spirit of God. This is a colorful word that is used for animals carrying away their prey. It suggests something that, that was fast and firm. God moved Philip on with, with power and, and authority and he takes him 20 miles north of Gaza, right? Philip must have been like, how in the world did I get here? It's like that, right? The eunuch doesn't even have a chance to say goodbye. But he's so focused on celebrating his new life, celebrating a, a life with a future. The eunuch celebrated, and Philip continues to evangelize. And yet I see something very cool here in this idea of being snatched away. When Philip was headed down to the wilderness, he's being obedient to God's command to travel down there. And humanly, again, you could wonder, man, what has he done wrong to experience the wilderness, right? Humanly, he, he could have been somewhat discouraged having to leave the center of the action and move to where he could easily be forgotten. I've been there, right? I'm like, God, why here? Why now, right? I, I'm following your instruction. Why are you taking me this way? We, we get impatient, don't we? We, we get frustrated. We, we second guess sometimes the will of God in our lives. However, once you do what God has told you to do, you start to realize what God is up to and your perspective begins to change. It's like being caught up in a whirlwind. Maybe that's how the Spirit snatched Philip up. You, you see, I don't think Philip ever expected to minister all the way up the coast from Azotad, which is Ashdod, to Caesarea. But by leaving Jerusalem, a move that seems counterproductive in human eyes, he discovered a ministry all the way along the coastline that was incredibly productive. He ends up in Caesarea, which is this major port city, right? It's almost like God rewarded his willingness to go into the wilderness by giving him a bigger responsibility as an ambassador to the coast. Can I just say, if you're willing to go into the desert places sometimes in obedience, then he can give you the ministry on the coast, right? If you're willing to say, God, I'll go to that place that you're calling me to, he will take you into a more fruitful place. If you're willing to go into what seems to be a desolate place, God will use you there and he will bring you to a more fruitful place. That's the way I see it. Honestly, in my life, that's the way it happens. That's the way I've experienced it, right? When we're faithful and obedient to go where God tells us to go and to reach out and share with those that he's put before us. Would you stand with me? As we prepare to move to the communion table in just a few moments, here's what I want you to remember as we look at this story. 
I want you to remember that Philip was, wasn't an apostle. He was a deacon who was chosen to serve tables. He was an ordinary man with, with a testimony of loving God with his whole heart, but the fruit of his surrendered life is still reproducing today. He was willing to hear and choose to obey, and really, that's all that's needed in a life that makes impact for God. Jesus does all the work. Scripture says that he's prepared good works in advance for us to do. And when Jesus was looking for a willing vessel, he saw Philip's heart. Somewhere along the line, Philip said, Jesus, take me, I'm yours. And as we move to a time of communion, I wonder this morning if you would say the same. I want to take you back to a question I asked earlier. It's this. Do you have a sense that the Holy Spirit is guiding you? Do you have a sense that the Holy Spirit's guiding your life? If the answer is no, then simply ask him. When you wake up every morning before your feet hit the ground, say, Holy Spirit, guide me today. Holy Spirit, lead me today. I, I, I surrender to you. If your answer is yes, though, and you say, oh, yeah, I do have this sense that the Holy Spirit is guiding me, then I want to challenge you this week to respond to his voice. When the Holy Spirit tells you to go, you go. <laughs> when he prompts you to speak, you speak. Stew away with the excuses, the not me's and the not now's and the not here's. And said, I hope that you would pray, God, use me right here, right now. Even if it's to minister to one person this week, can I just tell you God cares about that one. God cares about that one. And you might be that voice to that one. Remember that when Jesus was on the cross, he was dying for the sins of many, but he was ministering to one to his side. He was ministering to a thief beside him who needed to experience the grace and mercy of God. And so would you commit with me today to quit offering up excuses and to actually share the good news of Jesus this week wherever he leads you? As we move to the communion table, as we remember what Christ has done for us, let's let this be our prayer. Jesus, take me. I'm yours. Use my life. I'll be obedient. I'll, I'll go where you tell me to go. And even when I feel like I don't have the words, I'm going to open my mouth and trust that you'll speak. Amen? Amen. Let's focus on him as we prepare our hearts for communion.